Very early in 1977, my young family and I came from Australia to the United States. The distinct purpose for us coming here was to uh, complete a postgraduate degree and then go back to Sydney, where they had a job waiting for me. My field of study was cross-cultural communication. By nature, I'm observer of cultures, and, and, and therefore culture shock uh, was not something that I expected, uh, I was anticipating. But one of the first things I noticed working in a, a large church that Bob Boyle knows about uh, in, West, in uh, Southern California, I saw more people who suffered from emotional depression than I've ever seen in all the years of ministering in the previous nine years or so. Now, please understand, I am not talking about clinical depression or chemical depression. I'm just talking about sheer emotional depression. That was something new to me. Um, now, the question that plagued me at that time, why? <laughs> Uh, especially in those early days. Why? Why is that happening? Why is this so much emotional depression is so prevalent in the land of the free and the home of the brave? I mean, why? And during those years, 77 and 78, we lived on campus where I was studying, and uh, there were a lot of my neighbors who were doing their doctorates in psychology. There were several schools, and School of Psychology had, uh, was renowned, and, and so several of my neighbors in the married quarters uh, were studying for the doctorate in psychology. So uh, I wanted to know from them. So I would ask my neighbors, why am I seeing more of this than I've seen in previous years in Australia or anywhere else for that matter? One said, well, I'm not familiar with other countries, so I can't answer your question. Another one said, well, we live in a fast-paced society. Uh, another said, well, there's some people just not able to keep up with the technological advances. That was in the 70s. <laughs> Think about now, with the artificial intelligence and all that. The dizzying speed in which technology is moving. Well, God bless them all. I just could not get a satisfactory answer. I tell my friends, I said, I'm sometimes like a dog with a peanut butter on his lip. I, I just, I don't, set, I don't settle until I get the answer. So it was several years past when I transferred to Emory University and moved to Atlanta and so forth, but uh, I, I, I came to a conclusion. I, 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 I came to my own conclusion, my own, and that's why I'm repeating my own, so you don't have to agree with me. <laughs> uh, not the Word of God. There's nothing in the Word of God. I always try to make as clear as I can. And so for the one or two or three or four of you who are interested in my conclusion, <laughs> I came to the conclusion. There are two words, really, two words. Unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations. And this has got worse, not better. Now, I am told today by a, an authority on the subject, who's listening to me now, I know that I'm quoting an authority on the subject, that when you ask young people today, and you say, what do you want to do when you grow up? Well, back yonder in my day, it was, uh, you know, fireman, policeman, uh, doctor, engineer, uh, astronaut, uh, never heard a preacher. Uh, nobody ever said, I want to be a preacher. Uh, president, yes. But now, I'm told that the vast majority of young people who say, what do you want to be when you grow up? They said, I want to be famous. Uh, uh, that is a surprise to me. <laughs> How? It doesn't matter, I just want to be famous. But more importantly, here's what I learned about unrealistic expectations. If you're listening, say amen. amen. The more unrealistic the expectations are, the greater the depression when these unrealistic expectations are not fulfilled. Uh, the greater the hype, the harder the letdown, uh, the greater the buildup, 
the heart of the fall. And I keep saying unrealistic expectations, unrealistic expectations for a reason, for very good reasons. Let me explain this. If I have an expectation of myself to be a great singer, not just any singer, I mean Bocelli, right? <laughs> if, if I have that expectation of myself, not only that I'm gonna be depressed, but every one of you who's listening to me <laughs> will be depressed. <laughs> you got what I'm, I'm trying to tell you. I cause all my listeners depression. Now, beloved, I've seen this again and again and again and again, especially in relationships. Unrealistic expectations by husbands of their wives. Unrealistic expectations of wives by their husbands. Unrealistic expectations by parents of their children. Unrealistic expectations by children of their parents. Unrealistic expectations from employers to their employees and from employees to their employers. Unrealistic expectations of a church. And would you believe unrealistic expectations of a pastor? <laughs> the list goes on and on and on. But I'd like to get to the bottom line. Some of these unrealistic expectations as a result of comparing ourselves with others. Right, that's deadly. When we compare ourselves with us. Oh, if I have his money, or if I have her life, uh, or if I have her husband, or if I have his wife, if I have his job, or her job, if I had, if I had, if I had. And that is gonna cause you more depression than you realize. It's like the two women who were good friends in college, but haven't seen each other in a long time, and then they ran into each other in the street. And one asked the other, she said, uh, has your husband lived up to your expectations? She said, just one. She said, oh, which one? When he told me that he's not good enough for me. <laughs> All right. Getting close. Unrealistic expectations. Please listen very closely because I need to balance this. Always balance things. That's the problem, that our culture does not have balance. We swing from extreme to extreme. But I need to balance this. There are some who go to the extreme opposite. <laughs> no expectations whatsoever of themselves. Uh, these people who have no expectations of themselves, basically I call them, they're members of the pessimist club. They expect nothing, they accomplish nothing, they uh, strive for nothing. These pessimists expect nothing of themselves and so they never get disappointed. <laughs> now, beloved, that is equally dangerous, if not more dangerous. I just need to balance that. So what's the answer? The answer is, are you ready? Realistic expectations. <laughs> More specifically, I want to tell you about the realistic expectation that will never, 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 how many never is this? Never disappoint. And that is when you place your whole of your expectations on the promise of God, or promises of God in the Word of God. No matter what happens in life, no matter what difficulties you may be experiencing in life, uh, no matter how tough circumstances that you're in even now, no matter how long it takes, no matter how unrealistic these promises are in the sight and in the eyes of the non-believing world, no matter how long these expectations would take to be fulfilled, you can bank on the fact that sooner or later, God will fulfill His promises. So turn with me, please, if you don't mind. And if you do, you don't have to. <laughs> Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 32. Luke 2, 25 to 32. Let's put it on the screen. I'll tell you what, let's, let's just uh, 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 kind of change pace a little bit. I'm going to ask you to stand up. This is not the seventh inning strength, uh, stretch. Uh, this is the, first, the second inning. Okay, we haven't even got there yet. I'm going to read the first verse, and I want you to read the rest of it, okay? 
Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now you go. Glory to God. Be seated, please. This reading is about a man who was living in expectations. Expectations that is totally and completely anchored on the promise of God and the Word of God. This prayer known in the Latin, for, the Latin name for Nunc Dimittis. Nunc Dimittis is actually, that was a song that in seminary a million years ago, where I went to seminary, we used to have morning prayer, evening prayer in chapel, that we sang that, and I'm not going to sing it to you, uh, in the evening service, the evening prayer. And nunc dimittis just simply means now dismiss, now dismiss. The man who prayed this prayer, after seeing that which he has been expecting for a long time. After he saw the fulfillment of his expectations, this man name is Simeon. And that's about all we know about him. That's all we know about him. But from his prayer, we know that he had realistic expectations of the promise of God to be fulfilled. I'm gonna explain that in a minute. Because of his realistic expectations were firmly founded and anchored on the promise of God in the Word of God, he was not disappointed. Now, I want to make a very, very important application here, and then I'm going to come back to Simeon. This man and his prayer have impacted millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of people in the last 2,000 years. (laughs) Yet, he was not a famous preacher. He was not a television celebrity. He was not a superstar. Uh, He was not even a pastor or a theologian or a big name. Hear me right, please. If you think that God only uses big shot preachers and evangelists, please, please, please think again. So many of the greatest revivals in history, they were ignited by nameless and faceless but faithful people. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's my challenge to you. Here in chapter 2 of Luke, beginning verse 25. We meet such a man. He was not a priest in the Old Testament sense. Uh, He was not a high priest. He was not a rabbi even. He was not even a scribe. He was not church leader. He was not a member of Sanhedrin. He was not prominent in any religious sense whatsoever. Yet God in his sovereignty chose to fulfill his highest expectations. What was his highest expectations? His highest expectation was to see the fulfillment of thousands of years of promise in the Old Testament come to pass. The Messiah Jesus, Emmanuel, is here. And he was not disappointed. He was not disappointed. Simeon's expectations were not placed on Rome or even Jerusalem. (laughs) It was not uh, placed on a presidential candidate. Hello. Or the economy. Or the stock market. (laughs) His expectations were not even 
in the way the Bible describes him on his own righteousness and his own devotion. But his total expectations were anchored on the promise of God and the Word of God. Oh, beloved, listen to me. I can promise you on the authority of the Word of God that when your total expectations are placed firmly established upon the promises of God and the Word of God, He will not let you down. So my challenge to you is this. Dare to trust God. Dare to trust God. Say that with me. Dare to to believe what God said, even if the world says it's impossible. Expect what the world may call is unexpected. Hope for what the world calls hopelessness. Attempt what appears to the world to be unattainable. Be convinced of what the world calls inconceivable. See the invisible to be and the undoable. Hear me right, hear me right, hear me right. This is important. And if I brought a a challenge for you in the last 37 years almost, this is it. (laughs) There is no disciple of Jesus Christ at the sound of my voice who could ever say, oh, I am just an average Christian. Don't do that. Oh, I'm just an ordinary Christian. No, I cannot believe big things. I don't have big faith in a big God who has big promises. I just cannot wait for God to fulfill all his promises out of fear that I may be disappointed. You will not. I cannot dream big dreams for God, not big dreams for me, dreams for God, <laughs> because I'll be disappointed. I cannot claim to believe that all the unconditional promises of God are true and yes and amen. amen. Don't do that. Can I get an agreement? Amen. Some of you are not going to do that. What about the rest of you? Are you all going to not do that? Listen, I believe with all my heart that God is ready to use any of his willing children. I believe with all my heart in these last days that God is longing to use his surrendered children. Now back to Simeon. Done with the application, I'm going to go back to Simeon. As I said, he didn't have lofty titles, no name recognition, no high station in society. It was not famous or had a famous family. But what the Holy Spirit wanted us to know, what the Holy Spirit wanted every one of us, every one of us to know, is what God thought of him. What God thought of Simeon's, Simeon's faithfully waiting for the fulfillment of God's promises. God wants us to know what he thought of his longing expectation. And here are his qualifications for receiving this incredible, incredible privilege. He was righteous, not self-righteous. He was devout. And he was watching and waiting and never give up. Never give up. I know somebody wrote a book by that title. (laughs) Never give up. The word here actually denotes someone who is daily, daily standing guard. Standing guard. Someone who is daily reporting for duty. Here I am, Lord. What do you want me to do? Send me. Someone who's expecting God to fulfill his promises. It's like a sentinel watching and waiting and praying and serving and giving and trusting. Remember this. Because of all of this, because of all of this, God gave him a personal promise. That's a personal promise 
as different from the promise of God of the expectant Messiah. There are two promises. Okay, I'm going to come to that. This is really important because you, you have to be very, very careful. Man, at the moment somebody comes to me and says, well, the Lord told me to tell you, I run. <laughs> First of all, you need to know that in the Bible, there are three different promises. First of all, there is a general promise. Draw near to me, I draw near to you. These are general promises, all that are more conditional. But the, the promises of God that are in generality, anyone can claim. But then there is a conditional promises. They are conditional. That those promises God is not going to fulfill until and unless I meet the condition. Given will be given to you. It's a conditional promise. So, but then, are you listening? This is important. There are personal promises that God makes to you personally. Oh, but be very, 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 very careful. <laughs> because there are some people answer their own prayers, make a promise to themselves, and they blame it on God. Be extremely careful that you are listening to God with all ears and all heart and all mind. Be very careful. Lest you make yourself a promise and confuse your voice with God's voice. What I learned, listen to me, I, I was happy to, for people to not repeat my mistakes. What I have learned the very, 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 very hard way <laughs> about God's personal promises to an individual believer is that when that happened, read my lips. Keep it to yourself. Don't blab it. Remember Samson? Remember Samson? He had a bad haircut <laughs> because he blabbed it. He blabbed the personal anointing and calling of God on his life. Keep it to yourself. Then after God fulfills his promise, you can testify to the power of God, to the faithfulness of God, to the goodness of God, and you can tell about it. And that is why we see here in Luke Chapter 2, in Simeon's life, the Holy Spirit made him a personal promise. There was a promise of the coming Messiah. But then God made him a very personal promise just to him. So I don't want you to go in there and claim stuff and you say, well, Michael said. No, no, no. God made it specifically to Simeon. Because he was faithfully waiting for the coming of the Messiah, therefore, God told him, Simeon, you're going to see it with your own eyes. You're going to see it with your own eyes. Wow. So as soon as he held baby Jesus in his arms, he knew that God kept the personal promise to him. He kept both the biblical promise of sending his Messiah And the personal promise that he is going to see the Messiah with his own eyes. And so when he saw the Savior of the world, he said, now I can be released from sentinel duties. Now I can be dismissed from the duty of waiting and watching. Now I can depart in peace. Now I can go to glory and be with the Lord. Now it is time for me to step down from my watchtower. Now it's I, that I have seen the fulfillment of the lofty expectations of the promised Son of God, the virgin-born Son of God, I've completed my mission. I'm ready to go. I want to share a personal testimony with you. So painful to me, and I pray that God will give me the strength to just get through it. Um, many of you know the story. 
If you read my book, Trust and Obey, you know, and, and it's not just in one book. I tell it all the time. It's my testimony. Paul always talked about his testimony in walking, going to, Jeru- to Damascus and, and the vision. And, and I share my testimony to the glory of God. As many of you know the story. The doctors told my mother that she could never survive the pregnancy. And she needs to terminate it. But knowing that God called me to serve him while still in her, in her womb, my mother acted on the promise that she heard from our family pastor and risked her life to have me. But then, when I went through my rebellious stage, I always tell people, if God saved me, he can save anybody. When I went through my rebellious stage, she began to doubt. She began to wonder, have I really heard, has the pastor really heard from God correctly? And that's natural. But God in his grace and mercy, I'm going to shorten the painful experience, but God in his amazing grace and mercy brought me to himself on the 4th of July, in the 4th of, 4th of March, 1964. She went to be with the Lord in July of that year. Between March and July, I don't know how many times I've heard her say this. Now that God has fulfilled his promise, I can go in peace. And she did go in peace. Beloved, please listen to me. Luke chapter 2, verse 29. Simeon prayed, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. Question. What brought about this confidence in Simeon? Thank God I don't have to come up with the answer. It's verse 30. The answer. Because my eyes have seen the fulfillment of all of Israel's expectations. Oh, my beloved friends, please listen. When your expectations are on the promises of God and the word of God, you will never be disappointed in the long run. Simeon was privileged to see what Abraham longed to see and didn't see. What countless others throughout generations for thousands of years were longing to see and didn't get to see. Here's something I pray to God. I pray to God. I pray to God that you would not miss. You would not miss. You see, Simeon was not the first generation to wait for the Messiah. No, 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 no. He was the last line of long generations who were waiting for the Messiah. But he was the generation that was privileged to see it. For thousands of years, generation after generation after generation after generation were waiting with expectancy. And when they came to the end of their life, they said to the next generation, you watch for the Messiah, you watch for the Messiah, to the next generation, then the next generation. In fact, the apostle Paul himself thought that he's going to see the parousia. Can you say parousia? Parousia. Do you know what that means? The return of Christ. He thought he's going to see it in his lifetime. But when he came toward the end of his life, and the Lord had not returned, but he's going to go and see him first. He said to Timothy, now, Timothy, you're going to see the parousia. You live with expectation. And when Timothy came toward the end of his life, what happened? He told the next generation of disciples, you look for the return of Christ. You look for the parousia. And generation after generation. So what is, what is the lesson here? 
from the experience of Paul and Timothy and the following generation. If you're listening, say amen. amen. It means that every generation, every generation must live with the expectations of the coming of Christ. If the Lord does not return in my lifetime, I'll be telling my children and my grandchildren to be expectant of the return of the Lord. I don't know which one is going to see him. But we all must do that with our children and children's children. And that's precisely, precisely what the Old Testament saints have done. That's how they're saved in the Old Testament before the cross of Christ. They're Old Testament saints, the Old Testament believers. They were saved by going, listening to the previous generation that says you look for the Messiah and you look for the Messiah and kept going and they kept going generation after generation, never gave up until they come to Simeon. It all started in Genesis 3.15. After Adam and Eve sinned and God redeemed them with the slaying of a lamb, he said to them about the seed of the woman who's going to redeem them. And in their minds, they thought it's going to be the first generation. As soon as Cain was born, they said, here he is. That's what Cain means. Did you know that? Cain means here he is. They thought that was it. When the first child was born. No, 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 no. They didn't realize it's going to be a long, long wait. Far from it. (laughs) It wasn't Cain. So they passed that expectation on to the next generation. And the next generation. All the way to Abraham. And the Bible said that Abraham looked forward to the cities not built with God. Jesus said to the Jews, he said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. In fact, he said, Abraham was waiting for my day and was looking forward to it by faith. And that's why they want to kill him. Abraham looked forward with expectations. And then when Abraham died, his grandson Jacob, the next generation, when he was blessing his son Judah in Egypt. Remember, he was blessing each one of his 12 children. When he was blessing Judah, he said to him, he said, the Messiah is going to come from the tribe of Judah. Then it's followed by the generation of Exodus who were waiting for the Lamb of God. Followed by the generation of Leviticus who were waiting for the great high priest. Followed by the generation of Numbers who were waiting for the smitten rock followed by the generation of Deuteronomy, who were expecting the Messiah, the prophet, followed by the book of Joshua, where they were expecting the captain of the Lord of hosts, followed by the book of Judges, where the coming Messiah is going to be the judge of the world, followed by the book of Ruth, where he is going to be the kinsman redeemer, followed by the book of Samuel, the two books of Samuel, where he was the coming anointed one, followed by the books of Kings, where the coming Messiah is the King of Kings and the Lord of all lords, followed by the Chronicles generation, where he is the glory of the temple of God, followed by the Ezra generation, where the Messiah is the coming teacher who is from God, followed by the generation of Nehemiah, who is expecting the Messiah, who is the rebuilder of broken lives, followed by the generation of Esther, who was the protector of his people, followed by the generation of Job, who was the comforter in times of trouble, followed by Psalms, who is the good shepherd, followed by the generation of Proverbs, where he is the wisdom of God, followed by the generation of Ecclesiastes, where he is the preacher of the kingdom of God followed by the generation, the Song of Songs, where he is the bridegroom of his bride, the church, followed by the generation of Isaiah, where he is the righteousness of God, followed by the generation of Jeremiah, where he is the potter who shapes the clay of our lives into the image of God, followed by the generation of lamentation, where he is the weeping prophet, followed by the generation of Ezekiel, where he is the wheel inside the wheel, followed by the generation of Daniel, where he is the son of man, 
coming on the clouds with great glory, that he is the stone that is not cut with hands, and he is the fourth person walking in the fiery furnace, and followed by the generation of Hosea, where he is the love of God for the backslider, followed by the generation of Joel, where he is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, followed by the generation of Amos, where he is the author of judgment and of mercy, followed by the generation of Micah, where he is the great intercessor, intercessor between God and man, followed by Nahum, where he is the stronghold in the day of trouble, followed by Habakkuk, where he is the God of mercy, followed by the generation of Zephaniah, where he is, is the establisher of the kingdom of God, followed by Haggai, where he is the desire of all nations, followed by Zechariah, where he is the branch of Jehovah, and finally, the last, that generation of Malachi, where he is the refiner's fire, the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness that rises over all the world with healing in his wings. And the scripture then goes silent all the way and we come to Simeon. Who said, I've set my expectations. Not on a position, not on accumulation, not on false hope, not on people, not on things. But like all of my ancestors, I have set my expectations firmly on the promise of God. And now my eyes have seen the fulfillment of the promise of God in this virgin born baby that was holding in his hand. Now that I've seen the fulfillment of all the hopes and the dreams of all the previous generations who have been waiting for that first Christmas. Now Lord, Take me to glory. I have seen your amazing faithfulness. Now, beloved, as I come to the end, I want to remind you again, wrongly placed expectations or unrealistic expectations, expectations that are on people, or on things, sooner or later, you will be disappointed. You will be disappointed. But expectations that are placed firmly on the promise of God and the Word of God will never disappoint. Never, 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 never depress you, never disappoint you. God promised that He's coming back. Jesus promised that he's coming back. The scripture promised that he's coming back, not as a babe in the manger or a helpless body hanging on a cross, but he's coming back with great power and great glory. He's going to reign and rule with an iron scepter. He's going to come back to fulfill all of the hopes and dreams of his children who are waiting for their redemption. And the question is this, are you certain that when he does come back, if this is the generation that sees his return, are you certain that you're going to see him? Are you going to be with him? Are you ready? If not, you can't be today. You can't be today. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, I confess to you, perhaps, in any other time, and for over seven decades, that we have so much to distract us, to distract us, 
from watching and waiting. It is this generation, this time that we live in right now. So many distractions. But Father, you're not going to come back to a compromising bride. And so I pray for all of your bride, all of the faithful believers to begin to plan their expectations of you. And we thank you that one day, whether we go to you first or you come back first, we're going to see you face to face. I pray for that individual who may be afraid of that, who have never committed his or her life to Christ. I pray that this day be the day in which they make that commitment. I pray for that believer who's a compromising believer and who has got so many things going and that totally lost sight of the promises of God and the Word of God. I pray that this will be a day of renewal. Father, I thank you that you hear and answer prayers because that's your promise. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, praise the Lord. Will you stand up and sing with us? Thanks, Jeremy.